Hello and welcome to my office. We are having a session today exploring a, an aspect of the shadow that is about shame. It's about feeling not good enough, undeserving. We often know this today as imposter syndrome. That's become quite a catchphrase that many of us are familiar with. And like shame, I think imposter syndrome is actually a part of shame. So they go together, almost a perfect 1.0 correlation. The more shame we have, the more feelings of imposterism that we have, that we're not worthy, that we don't fit in, we don't belong at the big kids table, etc. cetera. Um, so they're very, very connected. and. Most of the shame we carry is not for the times we've made a mess out of things. Most of the shame we carry is connected to invalidation and mistreatment and worse at the hands of others. We were taught that we weren't right, that we weren't good, that our voice didn't matter. And we internalized it and the shadow becomes more dominant in our consciousness than our true self. And so we operate from this position of the shadow. And in fact, I actually prefer calling imposter syndrome shadow syndrome because of this. Like we aren't imposters. We have an activated shadow. We have been trained to believe that we are imposters because we don't fit in to the, the cis male white power structure. And until we say, I don't want to fit in in that world, we are, this is a, something we're always going to bump into until we start to see I'm not meant to fit in that world. That is not my world. I'm going to create a beautiful, soulful, magical world of my own and be with others who validate my existence and I will validate their existence until we shift that gaze. We truly are in the grips of the shadow and, you know, the shadow that has been conditioned to think that it is not right in this world. So this is a big big, big issue for many of us. I know it's been a lifelong challenge for me. I will say it's a lot better for me now, although it's still, you know, the shadow still kicks up once in a while, which I, I treat with mercy and grace and kindness and say, oh, I'm activated about such and such, feeling like an imposter, feeling like I don't belong. So what's going on here? Okay. Let's begin. Let's light our candles. So if you don't have a candle, just connect with the energy that I freely share and we'll do our simple ritual left hand counterclockwise this is the purification the banishment the release just anything that's percolating already just a few minutes into this conversation just see it like little burning flame petals flying off and extinguishing and now let's circle around, coming together, protecting us from all that which activates the shadow and really connecting to each other, connecting to those who validate and reinforce and who we validate and reinforce. And let's just invoke love, mercy, kindness, compassion for that shadow of ours. 
It does try to protect us. So um, this talk goes really well with the Babora Forba chapter in Entering Hecate's Cave. And in this chapter, there is a section on shame. So miasma is the idea from ancient Greece that it's like an energetic contagion where we pick up what we might call today toxic vibes from others, from the environment and so on. And that really sticks to us. And to me, miasma is, is a, a way of saying that that's what fuels the shadow. So then I uh, go into a discussion of shame. Miasma shows up as shame. It tells us we aren't enough and that we are unworthy. Characteristics of imposter syndrome. Shame can be the infection that's usually so hidden that we don't even know we have it. I highly recommend Brene Brown's excellent work on shame. And I borrow from her definition with the definition that I wrote in the book. Shame as the unmerited experience of deep feelings of unworthiness is often an unspoken problem that wounds deeply. Others can cause great harm by invalidating our true nature. So there is a lot to take in in terms of understanding shame, and you can read through that section. Further on in the book, I actually revisit shame at the very, very end of the book, because this is how insidious and important understanding where we are carrying shame is. I wanted to send everyone off um, with a reminder of being careful of shame and especially in validation by others. Shame is the currency of the shadow. I consult with mine once in a while because she is the expert on shame and my underlying fears. Talking to your shadow when you feel triggered by someone or something is an excellent practice in authenticity. Those outside of the power structure are often made to feel shameful. for simply showing up in spaces where they preside. The natural self-questioning talking to the shadow within is portrayed by those in power as evidence of imposter syndrome, which is such a vilifying label. But you're not the one in the wrong if you feel unheard and unwelcome in these circumstances. They are the problem. You have much to bring to these places, although it is certainly understandable if you find it daunting. Only through finding and speaking from our truth can we bring change to this world. Our authenticity fortifies us as we walk through the uncertainty of today's cultural landscape. Becoming who you are inside, on the outside, creates a sense of inner safety. A sense that no matter what happens, you can survive. Because the curious thing about authenticity is that it gives us the power to overcome just about anything and inspires others to become better. So that is the little blurb about imposter syndrome at the end of entering Hecate's uh, cave in the Core chapter. So let's dive in. I want to walk through some characteristics of imposter syndrome or shadow syndrome. I want to just give us a little bit of an orientation to where imposter syndrome comes from before I go through kind of characteristics. And I'm going to be referencing an absolutely game-changing, life-affirming article by Ruchika Tulshayan and Jody Ann Bury that was in the Harvest Business Review. And I will link to that in the notes as well. Imposter syndrome comes from some research that was done back in the 1970s by Pauline Rose Clance and Susan Immins. And they labeled it imposter phenomenon. And what their findings indicated to them was that high achieving women still persisted in believing that they weren't that smart and that there was kind of a trickery going on 
that they had faked this and that other people were fooled by them into thinking that they were competent, smart, creative, gorgeous, whatever it was. So this is the phenomenon. And I mean, we could critique their research methods. And of course, the research is kind of nested within everything that was going on in the 70s in terms of the women's rights movement and so on. But it's really, it's an important piece to keep in mind that women who are high achieving often feel this way. And at the time, you have to think of like what feminist scholarship and where the feminist movement was, it was very much in terms of evaluating women in terms of men, men's success, like what made a successful white man, white straight man, cis white straight man. And this idea that in order to be successful, women had to conform to that world. That was really one of the big discussion points at that period in time. I like to think now, you know, 35 years later, or 45 years later, sorry, we've moved on, but yet feelings of being an imposter can still persist, even with the social changes that we've had since 1978 when the article was published. Why is it that we feel this way? And most importantly, what can we do about it, right? That's the question. It's like, well, if we feel this way and we are dialoguing with the shadow self, with mercy and walking in the world with authenticity and not always being the angry one in the room, if we are trying to lead with integrity and dignity, how do we deal with all this, this is a lot, you know, as myself, as a, a cis woman in academia, a cis woman, you know, with the career that I have now, I I need to occasionally go into those rooms, you know, that it it is the territory of those, you know, what what I would think of like patriarchal norms, you know, like the lawyers, accountants all of these people, finance people. Uh, most of the time I am so privileged that I live in a world that is very self-validating and nurturing and I do my best to return this energy to those in my life. But it's still a thing that we need to go in those spaces. And I would say like even the education system, even today, I know there's been a lot of changes, but there's still remnants of where we were you know the idea that girls can't be good at stem uh the idea even and we can flip the genders around right like boys can't be uh good at cooking or something i don't know you know what i mean these stereotypes we get into all these stereotypes about gender roles when we start to unpack our imposter syndrome. There's a lot to take in. So whatever gender you identify with, this can turn up. I'm just, I'm talking about the fundamental research, which was done on business women and talking about my own experience as a cis woman. So I'm going to read just a few of my notes that I have about what I feel are the characteristics of imposter or shadow syndrome. One of the biggest ones is being paralyzed by fear. And this is really linked to perfectionism, that if we can't have something perfect, we're not going to do it. Or if we do something and it's not perfect, we, you know, it's not Instagram worthy or ready to be sold on Etsy or ready to be published, you know, by a big publishing house, that that's invalid. And that's a lot of... That's really linked to imposter syndrome, this paralyzation by fear. I can't do something because I might get it wrong or because I'm a fake and I'm unworthy. I don't deserve to have success. 
I don't deserve to have a space in my own home where I can truly express myself. I don't deserve to dress the way I feel comfortable in the world. All of these things, and it paralyzes us. And it gets back into uh, social comparison, which is such a big challenge, right? And often the social comparison we're doing is towards others that seem to be authentic because we feel inauthentic. So it can have benefits in terms of, you know, looking to public figures or friends that we aspire to, but to aspire to a level of freedom of expression and beingness in the world is very different than trying to be someone else because you're afraid that they'll find out you're not actually that way. And that was a big challenge. I had trying to be someone else for so long in order to be accepted because of fears, fears of not having economic security, fears of, you know, not having a loving relationship and so on and so on. So number one, look at what paralyzes you in your life. The key to overcoming this most disabling symptom is to start with small, specific goals. Whenever you are faced with fear about doing something, say to yourself, just for this moment, I am choosing fill in the blank. Making huge plans with vague details almost never works. This approach leaves us weak. You know, when we have these big, big plans, if we are doing a ritual or a spell or a working or making a plan for a project we want to accomplish. If it's just this huge thing, how do we get there? It's very confusing. And that's a lot of times what paralyzes us. So breaking it down into specific little blocks or steps will really, really help. Uh, my number two note is about perfectionism. And I want to say it again, the words of the great Jane Fonda, we are not meant to be perfect. We are meant to be whole. A tip I have for getting over perfectionism is something that's really helped me because I used to be so perfectionistic. And now I strive for excellence, not perfection, which is an important demarcation between those two. Excellence leaves room for wholeness. Excellence leaves room for intuition, uh, spontaneity, a little bit of creativity that's messy. That's wholeness. That's excellence. So you can do things that are messy. Don't make your bed for a few days. Nothing horrible will happen. Um, create a messy altar. All of these little practices of letting go of perfectionism can and seeing that the world doesn't stop to spin and that no one shows up at your door to haul you away to less than perfect prison, they can be really helpful. My next tip, number three on my list of tips, is that you are more than enough. You are how you are meant to be in this world. I really believe that. And I have struggled personally against this. So trying to fit in. And then one day on a very long road, uh, road, winding road, driving home from the university, I just said, you know what? Today, I stop and it was a longer journey to get myself to where I am today but I made a choice to say I am good I am right I'm not perfect I have limitations but I have a lot of capacity and you know just a daily affirmation can be so so helpful reminding yourself I am good I am enough. An affirmation I really, really love and practice all the time is that, you know, my, my body is my temple. 
My life is my ritual, my mind is the altar, and my soul is the shrine upon it. I abide in the temple of good enough. I am good. I am enough. So let's see where we are on the list. Number four, feeling like a fraud. Tricky little devil, that shadow, with its insidious hints and allegations that magic is foolishness and that we certainly aren't a real witch. I don't know if you ever, if you ever had this experience. That is a form of imposter syndrome. You have been conditioned to think that magic can't be real. You've conditioned to doubt about magic. And absolutely, doubt is part of life. We want to be observing what we are doing and healthy reevaluation that can include doubt is very important as we walk this crooked path. However, we need to determine where the doubt is coming from. Is it that intuitive doubt that says, I should do things this way. I shouldn't go to that place. I shouldn't work with that person. I shouldn't follow that public figure. That's no, that's healing, normative, important intuitive doubt. I am talking about doubt that's connected to shame and is connected to who we are rather than specific situations. My recommendation here is to truly develop a relationship with a spirit of your choosing. It can be our beloved Hecate. It could be uh, a spiritual ancestor. It could be one of the cards in the tarot. It could be an animal ally. Vulture is an amazing companion for doing this kind of shadow healing, shame recovery, getting over imposter syndrome work. Because vultures, of course, tend to the dead. And this is a very important work they do but how often are vultures vilified in our society if you are a vulture you need to be self-validating you need to know you are exactly as you are meant to be and that you have important work to do and it doesn't matter if some people make fun of you without you tending to the dead doing the dark healing necessary work of the world the world would fall apart so you know if you, there's a exercise in covina with we call it uh vita which means life our self-validating vulture very important piece of work to do Looking to others for validation. Oh boy, right? It's like, holy heck a day. Um, and I've already mentioned social comparison. So social comparison can be beneficial. Like I was saying earlier, it can help us be inspired and learn new things. And But looking to others to validate our existence, it is natural when you're like, I am feeling myself and looking good today. It's natural when someone says, you look great, that color is perfect on you, or those shoes, or you just look so good today. That It's natural to enjoy that kind of positive reinforcement. I'm talking about the validation for our existence. One of the greatest tasks that we can do to kind of let go of this is making these lists of things that speak truth to you. Whether they're values, boundaries, music playlists, whatever it is 
that brings us joy and truth and centers us in our being. Really shifting the gaze from others to what we love and what brings us life is so, so important. We do this owl exercise in Covina where the owl asks us the question, who am I? And I call it the individuation owl because the owl, by doing this exercise, and of course, owl is so important for wisdom and so on, um, that we see how rich we are, like how much we already have. And it again, it pulls that gaze away from others. And the more we discover our own talents, our own boundaries, our own values, the things about us that are very self-validating, the less we are looking to others for validation. Let's move on to number six, fawning over others. So this maps on to changing who we are to fit what we think are other people's requirements of our beingness in this world. The fawning over others is when we change what we do, even what we think, in order to get approval, in order to be validated. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're dating someone and they are very different than you, but you're attracted to them sexually. And there might even be some red flags, but you're like, yeah, that this is doing it for me. Um, and you, maybe they really like sports. I do not like to watch sports at all. I, well, I like women's soccer. I like the idea of women's soccer. I like to follow women's soccer, not so much actually watching the games, but once in a while I'll watch the big games. But anyway, other than women's soccer, I don't like to watch sports at all. And I would never volunteer to watch anything but women's soccer on my own. And women's hockey. Sorry, I can't forget women's hockey. Um, so in the past, and this is the distant, I'm reaching through time for this. I would pretend to like sports more than I do and watch sports games and so on with the person I was dating, if that's what was important to them. I don't really mind watching the sports but it's not something I would do on my own. So that's like a low grade fawning. Oh, I also forgot to mention the Boston Red Sox. Sorry. I guess there are some sports I like. Um, I don't like watching baseball though. It's horrible. Um, but there can be other things. Like I remember I was dating someone once and they were really convinced that I could like gussy up my appearance, wear more makeup, wear different clothes, et cetera. <laughs> and I did it. And in a way it was motivating, but in a way it was also fawning over them to make them like me more. But we had a real hot sex relationship. And, you know, if you've been there, you know. A lot of the fawning comes from childhood trauma to be more serious for a moment. That because we had invalidating or abusive parents we learn to fawn to placate them and to always change who we are this is a disorganized attachment style that we always changed who we are in order to try to get approval okay let's move on to number seven i know that's a big one your suffering doesn't define you no it doesn't it really doesn't this is a tricky one because we need to be open about our experiences and we need to do it when we are in a safe space to do so. Or if you were always thinking about the past, about your pain, about all the things that have been done to you, all the horrible people out in the world, you're dwelling in shadow land. You're dwelling in one of the shadow's favorite things, which is hyperattention to suffering. 
one of my favorite kind of tips for this for myself is that I have um, chronic sh shoulder pain and it, it can be quite debilitating, quite limiting at time. It's funny, my, my scarf just fell off of that shoulder. <laughs> Interesting. That shoulder wanted to be known. Um, so it's quite debilitating and it can really get me down once in a while. You know, it's like, oh, I miss all of the things I can't do because of this really bad shoulder. Um, and one of my exercises when I feel myself sliding into suffering zone is to re go to all of the, do a body scan, head to toe body scan and check in with all the parts of my body that don't feel pain that aren't restricted, that work perfectly fine, um, you know, and it's like shifting out of the suffering zone. It doesn't mean you're, you're failing to accept your pain. It means you're shifting your gaze. I do really like timer exercises that we set a timer for a certain period of time and say, this is the worry zone. This is the suffering zone. I'm going to go in. I am going to worry about the future. I am going to really ruminate on all my aches and pains and physical limitations. I'm going to dwell in the past. I'm going to do it all. It's really great if you journal or voice record all of what happens, your emotions and thoughts during these time sessions. And then I'm going to get on with my day. And I'm going to hail the power of suffering and pain. And like a ritual, it has a start, it has a finish, and then I get back to being me. My next tip, number eight, is being consumed by worries. This really goes to dwelling in suffering land. Um, we just did what we're calling a cathaldron, which is a little cauldron of release or a bowl. And just write your worries and on scraps of paper and put it in your cauldron. You can burn it if you like. You can drown it in water, watch it dissolve over time. Um, just letting your worries go. Because we have genuine concerns about things. And a lot of times our worries are activated around trying to fit in, trying to be acceptable, you know, like circling that imposter energy. It, again, it's different than healthy, regular doubt or concern. This is worries, like, you know, that spiraling that we can fall into. Number, uh, sorry, number nine, we're looping back to perfectionism is the control freak business. We are control freaks because we feel like fakers. And if we don't control everything, someone is going to find out that we're not a great mother. We're not a great partner. We're not a great worker. We're not a great writer. We're not a great healer. We're not a great witch. I don't know who these people are. I'm going to tell you something. Most people are too busy living their own damn lives to notice when we make a mess out of things. Let go of needing to control everything. Like the great rock and roll song says, hold on loosely, but don't let go. Create some space in your life. Let your children, your beloveds, your pets be who they are in the world. This is a hard one for me with my sons, even though they're at both adults now. Just they are, if I want to be an authentic being, I need to let other people also be their authentic selves. Okay, and my recovery tip, let go of minor details. And doing an energetic control inventory, like just sitting with yourself. Again, do this as a timed exercise or else I'd still be at it. Um, you know, the idea of what do I seek to control in life? So I seek to control my finances. I seek to control everything that goes on in my home. Um, I seek to control what goes on in my work. I seek to control what I eat, what when I sleep, how I spend my free time, et cetera. Like just do this type of inventory and then ask yourself, 
how can I loosen up a little bit? The tighter we control things, the less room there is for the magical, the spiritual, the deeper world. You know, if you're building a relationship with a, a, a spirit to kind of help you recover from all of this, like don't try to control them, right? Let them be who they are. There is so much control that we are unaware that we are doing. Now, this, this doesn't mean that you don't lead with intention your own life. It means being aware of where you're controlling things, letting go of things that are truly uncontrollable, and not using magic and even the kind of magic, like just magical thinking, like if I think about this enough, I can control it. Like just trying to let go a little bit. Okay, number one, or sorry, number 11, denying and loathing our bodies. This is a huge challenge for me. It's an ongoing challenge. I am recovering from this. All of these things, it, this often links to our suffering zone, right? That we have chronic pain or uh, you know, different conditions and so on. And it, they can really make us hate our body. For me, my disconnect with my own body goes way, way back. Probably for the, the first time I had my period, I think I was in the sixth grade. We were playing soccer, baseball of all things. And I was really embarrassed and felt like an imposter, like I'm with all these other people who aren't having this blood rushing out of them. Why, why am I doing this? I didn't have a good kind of sex education up to that point or at all by my parents or in the school, because this is, you know, back in the early eighties, I guess it would be. Um, So for me, this is a deep, deep one. I've always been curvy. I've had an eating disorder for most of my life. I'm in recovery from that. I'm accepting myself as plump um, and still healthy. I'm all my different, you know, the different tests that you get for the white coats. Everything is good and healthy in that land. And just trying not to loathe my body because I'm not a size six. Doesn't that sound ridiculous when you say it out loud? I hate myself because I'm not this size. Like I would never hate someone else because of the, anyway, it's just, there's a lot. So recovery, dancing, getting into your body. This is one of the things I have noticed, which is those who carry a lot of trauma, we get really disconnected from our bodies and we live in emotions, which of course come from the body, but we're also paradoxically disconnected from our bodies, but we get very much into the mind. Doing whatever you can to become embodied again. We have the monthly moves classes um, in Hecate's Keys, for example, that are designed to really help with all of this, whatever you can do to get back in your body. I also really recommend um, working with a mirror, like a, your scrying mirror if you have one or you can make one, and just contemplating yourself. One of the exercises that I did in my 30s, honestly, I had never done this until I was in my 30s, was taking a, a mirror and looking at my female external reproductive areas and bits. I'd never did it. I had a child and I hadn't done it. Um, This was the era when the vagina monologues hail to them and all they did. But that was when they were popular. And, you know, like, so look at all your body parts, especially the parts that are kind of a mystery to you. And you can use a scrying mirror or an actual mirror and just seeing your physical beauty, whatever that looks like, 
and then softening the gaze and seeing beyond your physical self the body is our teacher it is not perfect it can be a pain and just letting that go uh, number 12 having a fixed mindset this links to everything else i've been talking about a growth mindset, which has become quite a popular concept in education. A growth mindset is that I haven't solved the problem yet. A growth mindset says I can be resourceful, creative, curious, intuitive, and I can learn and grow and evolve. A fixed mindset is that I can't figure this out. This problem can't be solved. I can't do it. I don't have enough money for this thing I really want to do. That is a prime example of a fixed mindset. If you really want to do it, apply a growth mindset to it. If this thing costs $500 and you really want to do it, how can you get the $500? That's a growth mindset. A fixed mindset is I can't afford it. A lot to take out. Botanical and animal spirits are really good for helping us with this. Allowing ourselves to use our imagination and our creativity to see them as whole spirits and talking to them and working with them in different ways. You can see your own imagination, your own curiosity opening up and you will learn so much from them and just learn something new it can be something really really simple um, it can be something witchy or something practical just learn something new i mean youtube is great for that whether it's macrame or decoupage or something practical like learning how to fill cracks in your house and, you know, do it, learn it enough, and then you can decide that's not for me. And that is, that is standing in your own power, right? That's what that is. We're not going to have the skill set for everything. And that's fine. That's growth mindset. I cannot do everything. Uh, and finally, I end my list with the good old number 13, which is the refusal to rest, which is the refusal to rest. This links to everything else, right? And this goes to our grind culture that we live in, that our worth is determined by how productive we are, which productivity is narrowly defined as how much money can we make for somebody else? Let me say that again. How much money can we make for somebody else? It's not How much money can we make for ourselves? How good can I feel? The the mentality, and if you haven't read Caliban and the Witch, I recommend reading that. Caliban and the Witch is what it's called. C-A-L-A-B-A-N. Caliban and the Witch is a great book that seriously discusses um, the system in which we live, where our value is determined by how productive we are that makes money for somebody else or another service for somebody else. And that's what that means. This is comes from Calvinism and Puritanism, two really leading forces that developed the culture here in North America. We need, resting is radical. And if there is no other exercise that you except as a challenge from the list I've read through, this is the one that you want to do. And you can set your timer. I don't mean sitting there doom scrolling or just sitting on the couch waiting for the net to do the next thing. I mean, actually resting, doing something calm that brings you joy laying down if you're tired not denying your your tiredness it's like a badge of honor in us in certain areas of our society where it's like oh i worked 80 hours this week 
and I haven't slept and I've done all those things. Why, in the name of Hecate, would that be an achievement? We need sleep and rest in order to survive. And if we can deny these basic instincts of ours, then somehow we win at life. It's so weird. So take a rest. I hope you have gleaned something that might be helpful from this little talk about imposter syndrome and shame and the shadow. Go gently on yourself. Don't beat up your shadow. Don't beat up yourself. A lot of this is programming we've been subjected to that was beyond our control. And part of learning to live from our center of authenticity is rejecting that, the external that has done this to us, not the parts of ourselves that have been made to feel wrong. We are good. We are enough. We abide in the temple of good enough. And we hail Hecate and all of our spirits.